Beloved in Christ, welcome, welcome. My theme is the early church, its life and witness. Let us pray. O God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Let your light shine in our hearts to give us the lights of the knowledge of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I am sharing with you my passion for a church of Jesus Christ filled with the Holy Spirit and how its members as the body of Christ, wherever the Lord has put you in your vineyard, work together for the kingdom of God. This is our Lord's longing. I want to talk to you about the Church of God and about your role as members of the body of Christ working together for the kingdom of God. So let us together look at the life and witness of the early church. They all work together for the kingdom of God because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you wanted to summarize in a single sentence the message of Luke's two volumes, his gospel and then the Acts of the Apostles, it would be this, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Luke's large picture in his mind was to illustrate the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In his first volume, the Gospel according to Luke, there are five illustrations of the gift of the Holy Spirit. The good news of God's justice, the good news of spiritual power, the power to embrace suffering, the power to love freely, and the power to redeem humanity. And in his second volume, the Acts of the Apostles, the gift of the Holy Spirit is illustrated and demonstrated in three ways. The Holy Spirit energizes, the Holy Spirit transforms, and the Holy Spirit creates the church. And all three activities of the Holy Spirit have a present continuous tense. It is the context of the gift of the Holy Spirit that have chosen to illustrate the gift of the Holy Spirit by looking at the life and witness of the early church taught to us by Luke in Acts chapter 2 verses 4. 2 to 47. Please turn to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And I read, That day about 3,000 took him at his word, were baptized and were signed up. They committed themselves to the teaching of the Apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Everyone around was in awe, all those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pulled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful, as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day, their number grew as God added to those who were saved. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, we have a kind of lightning summary of the life and witness of the early church. First of all, we notice that it was a loving church. The 3,000 who were converted through the explanation of Peter of the meaning of what was happening on the day of Pentecost and many of others the Lord was adding to the company, we read, they all steadfastly persevered, devoting themselves constantly to the instruction and fellowship of the apostles. And one of the great perils of the church is to look back instead of looking forward. It has been unkindly said of the Church of England that it moves forward by looking backwards. Because the riches of Christ are so inexhaustible, we should never be going, 
Because the riches of Christ are inexhaustible, we should ever be going forward. We should count it a wasted day when our churches don't even learn something new and when we haven't penetrated more deeply into the wisdom and grace of God in Christ. Perseverance, steadfastness, and devotion to the teaching of the apostles is crucial. Secondly, it was a church of fellowship. It had what one might call the quality of togetherness, generously sharing. Lord Nelson explained his victory at the Battle of Waterloo by saying, I had the happiness to command a band of brothers. The church is a real church only when it's band of brothers and sisters. We should be able to say to each other, I could not live without you. They steadfastly persevered, devoting themselves constantly to the instruction and teaching of the apostles and fellowship of the apostles. Thirdly, it was a praying church. These early Christians knew that they could not meet life in their own strength and that they didn't actually need to do that. They always went into God before they went out into the world. They were able to meet the problems of life because they had first met the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. So they steadfastly persevered, devoting themselves constantly to the prayers. No Christian is greater than their prayer life. And prayer isn't about saying prayers. It is making ourselves available for God the Holy Spirit to pray in, with, and for us. For the Spirit intercedes and pleads for us and makes us cry out, Abba, Father. St. Paul says in Romans 8, verses 27 and 15. But also St. Paul goes on to say in Romans 8, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray or offer worthily as we ought. But the Holy Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on our behalf unspeakable yearnings and groanings or grunts too deep for utterance. A story is told of a three-year-old who had just learned the alphabet. His mother said to him, remember to pray before you go to sleep. And he knelt by his bedside and recited the whole alphabet, A up to Z, and then said, Please, God, turn all that into prayer. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, we read, If any people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God longs to meet with us for he will show us the path of life. And in his presence, there is fullness of joy. In his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16 and verse 11. Father Gilbert Shaw writes, the purpose of living is not to learn to make prayer, but to become prayer, to live in and for God according to the divine call, wholly surrender to the Spirit's activity in the soul for the glory of God. So, the early church, they steadfastly persevered, devoting themselves constantly to the instruction of the apostles, fellowship and prayer. Fourthly, it was a reverent church. We heard a sense of awe, reverential fear came upon every soul in verses 43. It was said of a great Jew, Methuselah, that he moved through his world as if it were a temple, constantly aware of God. And then one day he went walking, and they never saw him again, walking hand in hand with God. You see, the Christian lives in a reverence because they know that the whole earth is the temple of the living God. Our God is holy, awesome in power, a consuming fire, 
and rich in mercy. Let a sense of awe, reverential fear, come upon every soul that calls upon the name of the Lord. Fifthly, it was a church where things happened. Many signs and wonders were performed through the apostles, Christ's special messengers. Verse 43. If we expect great things for God and attempt great things for God, things happen. More things will happen in our churches if we believe that God and us together could make them happen. What we need isn't great faith, but faith in a great God, a God who makes the impossible possible. Sex, it was a sharing church. All who believed, that is, who adhered to and trusted in and relied on Jesus Christ, were united and together they had everything in common and they sold their possessions, post their land and movable goods and distributed the proceeds of the sale among all, according to any indeed who had need. Verses 44 to 45. These early Christians had an intense feeling of responsibility for each other. A real Christian can't bear to have too much when others have too little. Seventh, it was a worshipping church. Day by day, they regularly assembled in the temple with united purpose, and in their homes, they broke bread, including the Lord's Supper. Verse 46. They never forgot to visit God's house day after day. We must remember that God knows nothing of solitary religion. Things can happen when we come together. And during this time of, of and during this time of COVID-19, many of us are beginning to rediscover what it is to pray in homes what it is to be together in homes. And my hope is that when eventually the shutdown has stopped and we go out, there'll be such an exuberance of joy in the power of the Spirit. You see, God's Holy Spirit will move upon his worshiping people in the churches here today. Eighth, it was a happy, joyful church. They partook of their food with gladness and simplicity and generous hearts. Verse 46. Gladness was there. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms. For joy is one of the characteristics of the church. The characteristic of a Christ-like person. Ninth, it was a church with people others couldn't help liking. Constantly praising God and being in favor and goodwill with all people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were being saved from spiritual death. Verse 47. You know, there are two Greek words for good. Agathos simply describes a thing as good. And then kalos means that a thing is not only good, but also looks good. It has a winsome attractiveness about it. Real Christian disciples is indeed a lovely, a lovely thing. There are so many people who are good, but with their goodness possess a streak of unlovely hardness. In the early church, there was a winsomeness in God's people. They constantly did a lovely thing. Sadly, our discipleship is primarily a performance. To them, it was a real experience of the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we are practically, I think, driven to accept that they are, we are practically driven to accept their own explanation, which is that their little human lives had, through Christ, been linked up to the very life of God. I want you to remember the fact that the New Testament was written and the lives of the early Christians caught up with the good news of Jesus Christ 
were lived against a background of paganism. There were no churches. There were no churches. There were no Sundays to be observed. No books, no texts, no website of the faith, nothing. Slavery, sexual immorality, cruelty, callousness to human suffering, the treatment of women as household goods, and a low standard of public opinion were universal. Traveling and communications were chancy and perilous. Most people were illiterate. No wonder God so loved the world that he didn't send an email or a text or a tweet. Many Christians today talk about the difficulties of our times as though we should have to wait for better ones before the gospel can take root. It is heartening to remember that the gospel took root and flourished amazingly in the condition that would have killed anything less vital in a matter of weeks. These early Christians were on fire with the conviction that they had become through Christ literally sons and daughters of God. They were prisoners of a new humanity, founders of a new kingdom. They still speak to us across the centuries. Perhaps if we in our mission units believed what they believed, we might achieve what they achieved. So our task is to raise the level of expectancy, reintroduce an abundance mindset back into the good news of Jesus Christ. It is all about life in all its fullness. Past sins forgiven, new life in the present, and hope for the future. Secondly, our task is living today as if tomorrow is already here. Expecting the unexpected, always pointing to the sender of his mission, Jesus Christ. And we must realize how bad things are. And the question is, not one of should we or shouldn't we change? We should change that too. If we don't change now, we will sink. We can't go on as we are which incidentally was the message of Jonah many, many centuries before. The question is, how can we work together to encourage those around us to be confident in the way we are traveling with Christ? Refocusing our eyes on Christ and Christ alone. Please open your heart. Surrender fresh to Christ. Tell him the things that have not been right, that by his grace you put them right. Invite the Holy Spirit to fill you to overflowing. May he shed his love in your heart to overflowing. God bless you.